everyone we'll just give a couple uh, minutes to let everyone get signed on before we get going All right, I think folks will keep joining us, um, but uh, let's get going. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm, um, I'm Leita Youngren. I'm the VP of Marketing at Triple C, and um, just a couple quick announcements. One is that next week, we're actually going to move this call to Wednesday at 3.30, um, and I hope you'll also be able to join. We'll send out invites and um, social, we'll post it socially, but on Thursday, we're pretty excited because Danny Meyer is going to join us, and we're going to have a, um, a chat, a fireside chat between him and Jonathan Morris, our CEO and founder. So hopefully you can join that as well. That'll be more of a webinar style, um, So, but we don't want to lose this format and the networking and everything we're learning from each other. So we'll continue to do so um, just next Wednesday and we'll, we'll be sure to remind you. Um, another just housekeeping note, when uh, we want you to all participate as much as possible, just if you can give a quick intro, as tell us your name and where, um, where you are from and if you are associated with a restaurant, it's okay if you're not or if you're furloughed, but um, we just would love to, to know a little bit more about you and frame of reference when you're speaking. And, um, and with that, uh, we're going to continue our discussion on um, reopening and how, um, how we're navigating this and any standards that are in place and how your um, venues are moving forward. And um, if we can just have a quick intro of the triple seat folks on the phone, just that way you might know some. Um, you know, you know, I don't know who wants to begin. Um, Rachel. I can start, yeah. So I'm Rachel, I'm the event manager here at Triple Seat and I'm coming from you from, coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. So, this, so this, right. this stuff is going on. Hi, I'm, oh, I'm Whitney. Oh, sorry, Andrew. Okay, go ahead. I'm, of course, now my phone's freaking out. Um, I'm Whitney. I am an account manager with Triple Seat, and I am in Nashville, Tennessee. Awesome. Hi, I'm Azure Collier. I'm the content marketing director, and I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Hey, I'm Lisa. I do hotel marketing at Triple C, and I am coming um, also to you from Atlanta. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Mark. I'm a graphic designer at Triple C, coming to you from outside of Boston. I'm Kate Kennedy. I'm the customer marketing manager at Triple C, and I am in New Hampshire. All right, I think we got everyone. Um, all right, with that, we're going to start off with a little survey. Um, let's see how, who's on the call, who's currently open, who's prepping to reopen, and who's doing any alternative forms of delivery or takeout, or if you're still closed, that's okay, too. Um, with the magic of polling, boom. Uh, hold on. <laughs> there we go. 
there's a couple <laughs> more questions in here too with um you know if you are open or if you are going to be opening soon like what the expected capacity is and how you're preparing like your seating arrangements so yeah bonus poll bonus i love these polls i feel like they give us so much insight into what's going on we're missing holly was it Holly. Um, she said she might join late. She emailed me. Okay. okay. <laughs> cool. I feel like her updates are, are, we've followed her. Those of you who have been on the call for the last few weeks, we've followed Holly's journey with opening in, um, in Tennessee. And so it's been, it's been a nice progression. She said, I just right, Maz, when it, her. She said she's going to get on now. Yeah. Perfect. Good. <laughs> Tell her that's great. We called her out. Now she's yeah. coming. Magic. There she <laughs> Magic. <laughs> um, all right, Maz, we have results. Um, it looks like everybody's pretty shy because it doesn't look like anybody's answered. No. Come on, guys. I answered, so you should have some. Okay. I, I did it well. too. We're also sharing the results with the blog post um, after this that we uh, choose to share That's the true. recording with. And uh, we're making graphics to show these poll results so you could see them there too. Okay. You guys are at the forefront of the information we're giving, we're delivering to like our PR teams and everyone because this is just like, this is gold. I'm sorry, that was weird audio. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened. It didn't like record any of them. Oh, bizarre. I can. Maybe we can throw it up there in a little bit, but we can. Sorry, guys, if you want to take a second to just click those through. Sorry if you already did, but um, helpful for us to, to know um, and compare from last week. We had um, just so you know, last week we had about 16% of the folks on the call were reopened and um, some were opening that 4% was opening the next week and there was 50% that still didn't know. So it'd be, I'm curious to see where we land this week with that. Anything, Maz? No, I think I have to do no. some troubleshooting, so. Okay. Bear with me. All right, well, moving on. Um, we'll get that pull back up when, when Maz has figured it out. Um, so those of you, well, you know, what um those who can someone raise their hand hat who has opened i know holly anyone else on the call has opened i have but i'm kind of um a different kind of case i work for panera so i have mainly um like takeout and delivery to begin with and we still doing like catering for like hospitals and um like the testing sites and things of that nature angelica where are you located on Long Island. Okay. I have a question, Angelica. Um, with your catering and delivery, hi. Angelica hi. and I used to work there. Um, with the catering and delivery, have you seen a large format or any upticks in the social catering and delivery and or any, I know in New York for us, most offices are not open. Right. Uh, only essential workers are going in, so maybe you're getting catering orders there, but have you seen any different trends in the sales groupings? Um, well, obviously, mainly like medical right now is what's ordering. Um, we're still getting some offices that are ordering, um, but groups under 20 where they have like social distancing in place within the office, mm -hmm. um, where they would normally be like 100 plus. Otherwise, I'm not seeing any any social, really, um, except for people that place orders like for their families ahead of time in catering. But that's not so much, you know, it's not any majority of it. And does Panera do all of the delivery on their own or do you use services? And if you use outside services, which ones would you say are the best? Because I know New York City is trying to pass that. Um, regulations on third-party fees because some of them are 24 34 percent and they're really killing us restaurants so yeah it's crazy we're hoping it goes down to that 20 percent while the restaurants are closed um so we use like a mix we have private like delivery services that we use it depends on the area so like suffolk nassau we have people in place that work for us that do delivery mm -hmm. um 
And then in the boroughs, we have private services that we use that provide the delivery service for us. Um, they're more reliable and we have more control of the information as opposed to like a DoorDash, which we've tried. But their their fees are crazy and they're not so much last minute. Like you need to get those orders in, say by like three o'clock the day before when a lot of our businesses came, you know, within like a 12 hour range. And you think the private services are better within like that same, like I want to call tonight or I want to call at two o'clock for a five o'clock order. And would you be yeah. willing to share any of those companies? Yes. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll share with you who he is. Oh, amazing. Um, but I think they're a little bit more like white glove kind of service. Like we even have people that we've formed relationships with that were Uber drivers for us that we just use them now because we know that they're dependable. And instead of them getting charged through, you know, paying out a portion of what they make to Uber, us paying that commission, we just cut out the middleman and we pay them directly. So and that's always an option. Right. So like Panera doesn't carry that insurance either. Right. Exactly. That's huge. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's super helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. I got the email that Marissa and Zuma are, are prepared to open for delivery and takeout. So this is where I think the question, line of questioning is coming from. Is that for all of your properties, Marissa, or just New York? New York, Miami, and Boston. New York just started on Wednesday. Miami and Boston have already been doing delivery. Um, our Vegas location, Rebecca is actually on the call, but that's in yeah. the Cosmopolitan, which right. is we're, we're kind of dictated by when they open, I think, unless Rebecca jump in if I, you have any more information on Vegas. No. Yeah, as of now, um, uh, we're still not allowed in our building. So Las Vegas is actually open, so our restaurants are open. It was a crazy Mother's Day weekend. There was reports all over. It was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so local restaurants are open here at 50% capacity, but the strip is still shut down. So casinos and hotels are still not permitted to be open yet. Yeah. So Holly, update. Sounds like it looks like Holly has a hey, friendly hey. day off and she's not in the restaurant today. Um, but what yeah, Holly uh, uh, work from home today? That's great. So what it how you know your week, this is your third week, right? That you've been open. Yep, it's um, our third week open. It's our first week for our Nashville stores, um, which has been very unique um, because our Nashville stores um, have not done as well as the other stores have um, since opening, mainly because Nashville is pretty much um, office buildings and tourists, and people are still staying at home, obviously, and people aren't traveling. Um, so like the first two days that we were open, we did what we do on a normal lunch for in those two days. So we're still pushing um, the to-go packs and the delivery as much as we can. Where the other stores, like our store in Franklin had an awesome Mother's Day. Um, we were only like, I think a thousand or two thousand dollars under what we did this time last year for Mother's Day. Wow, that's really incredible. Yeah. Was anybody? So it's been else? very neat. Sorry, go ahead, Holly. No, I, I was just gonna say, it's been really unique because the one thing we're noticing is our slower stores that are in our more suburban rural, rural areas are doing better because people are at home right now. Whereas the stores that usually do really well, like Nashville are struggling right now. As you can see, I'm playing ball with my dogs. Um, yeah. Are struggling right now because of our location. That is interesting. Um, Whitney, you're also in Nashville, and um, she Whitney works with Holly, but are you seeing with other customers in Nashville, anyone that's open, have you had feedback on this as well? Is there, is there still more of the takeout delivery model um, that's more successful than dining? Is anyone dining in? What are you hearing? Yeah, so um, Holly's my main Nashville customer that's reopened. I have some that are reopening the end of this week. Um, so we'll see how they do. Some of them had opted to close entirely and not offer takeout uh, in the meantime. So we'll see kind of what happens. I have a number of locations throughout Tennessee though. 
um, in the other big cities and in some of the more rural areas like Collie has too. So we have um, a larger group that's got 17 locations throughout Knoxville mostly and, a, and some surrounding smaller cities. And um, they also have an event venue. So that's been really interesting to see what's happening with them. Um, they, their restaurants, similar to Holly, like they've done pretty, they pivoted pretty well with the takeout and they are seeing people coming in. Um, even in Knoxville, Knoxville reopened a little bit about a week or two before Nashville did. So I think people have like, kind of jumped on board with that and they are um, willing to be out and about and are not super scared. Um, their event venue though, they have, and just for their events in general, so away from that a la carte dining, and I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but they've experienced a lot of pushback from very pushy mother of the brides, brides, social clients who are now that things are reopening and we're seeing what those events might look like that are gonna take place and how many people. They have people being extremely pushy about, um, okay, well, a wedding's technically a gathering and I can only have 10 people, um, but you're, what if you go by the 50% capacity rule? So can I have 150 if your whole venue takes 300? And she's been really navigating um, just like ethically, if they really want to take that on, if they want to put their staff in that position. Um, and then they're, they have uh, also experienced, and this is just like, you, there's just crazy, crazy times. It never ends. Um, there's people venue shopping based on county restrictions because she has things in multiple counties and people are like, the same people will ping her for the same event and they're venue shopping based on the county restrictions. So I think like when one door, like it's just a revolving door of new issues we never thought we'd have to deal with. But I think that's something to start thinking about because obviously some of these pushier social clients are already thinking about it and, you know, um, where you can't go against the law, obviously, but um, kind of, thinking about how to get ahead of some of those pushy clients. Right. We're, we're, um, yeah, we're dealing with that too, because one of our restaurants, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Holly. I was gonna say, we're dealing with that too, because one of our, our restaurants has a venue on top of it, um, at the second floor, and we had one pushy mother of the bride this week that was like, well, if it's 50% capacity, then you should be able to seat us in the upstairs. And we did tell her, you know, it's a venue versus a restaurant. But not only that, we sat down as a company and said, well, what's the right thing to do? There's a restaurant here, and Whitney, I don't know if you saw it on Facebook, um, that got smashed on Facebook over the weekend because they opened and they were serving from the bar and there were pictures all over of not social distancing and they've got really bad backlash about it and so we sat down as a company and said well what's the right and wrong thing to do like technically yes we could sit seat these people upstairs and do it as a restaurant with you know six feet apart six per table da 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 but then at the same time is it safe for our staff and what will it look like if someone takes a picture and posts on social media right. and that's been our big thing right now and the same thing is we've had a couple of weddings the end of this month I said well instead of having it at the venue we'll do it in our backyard can you cater it and we said yes we could drop the food off but we cannot have our staff there because we felt that it wasn't right to put our staff in that situation where they might not feel comfortable if people aren't social distancing it's interesting that's actually we've seen um we this past week not uh it's not a customer specifically but we've seen these ideas of these micro parties floating around where it's off-site catering, the restaurant bringing you a package deal with, you know, whatever X amount of food for six to 10 people in a safe, you know, on their own, it's off-site and including a server. So taking the events off-site and bringing them to you, but would include staff. Um, 
And I think that that's not necessarily a right now. It might be more of a summer proposal, but it's, it is one way once I feel like the parameters are clear, but clear, but again, you bring up a good point. We don't, you don't want anyone to be um, not practicing whatever needs to be done right now, given the state parameters. So it's, it's tough. It's tough to make this work properly for people on site or off site. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that goes. I mean, as things maybe loosen up a little bit, I think it will be one way maybe to, to have an offering and not lose all that on site event revenue by taking it off site and having people controlling it in their own homes. Um, I don't know if any of you are setting up preparing for those types of um, situations or packages. And we've also, um, so I'd be interested to hear that. And also we've been hearing that people are kind of calculating what the per person kind of cost would be per seat and, um, at, you know, how that looks for when people start dining in, how are you going to calculate how and when people um, dine in and for how long they can be there? Is it going to be set limits of times like we've talked about before, like seatings, like an eight o'clock seating, a six o'clock season seating? I think, Holly, you guys had talked about doing that, right? Like different... No, we no, I think I think that was Zuma or somebody, but that was something that came up. Or no, it was that company in Miami that it was the um, yacht. It was the right, yacht right, right, right. timed like allotments. Lots. Like, like you got yes. a number one through thirty boarded at yep. six. Right, right, right. Third, whatever. But is there anyone else that is um, that thinking about how you're going to flip that dine-in business or that event business in sort of these these ways? Zuma is waiting for the WHO and the CDC to kind of tell us what those regulations will be, um, whether it be timed um, seatings, whether it be you have to make a reservation ahead of time, or, um, you know, disposable menus versus a QR code, whatever they're recommending and whatever those um, guidelines set by the state is what we will be following when that time comes. New York City has a little bit of time, obviously, so. Yeah, Any? is there anyone else on the call that's open? I see a show of hands or no? Because our poll didn't let us no. do our work for us. So really right now it's only Holly is open and, and Panera, you're doing a little bit, you're doing the takeout, Angelica and Marissa, you're starting that takeout this week? Yes, Miami's hoping to open on the 19th and like the government will be in phase one, hopefully. So that would be our first U.S. shop to potentially open um, because the strip is not open in Vegas, just just outside of the strip. So I think those would be our two shops to first open. Um, Boston and New York, I think, are still a ways behind that. Is anyone, as you prepare this, are you doing menu modifications right now? Thinking of of ways that um, I mean, I know Zuma specifically is a big share. Um, Mm -hmm. menu right yeah so it's definitely being discussed um it, it's going all the way up to our founding chef reiner because obviously um if you haven't heard of zuma it's a contemporary modern um japanese restaurant so everything it's we do is amazing is oh, thanks, Molly. <laughs> thank you come by for drinks when we open not at the bar <laughs> um <laughs> So everything is served izakaya style, which is an informal, essentially like small plates sharing for all. There's no way in, in, in my mind on God's green earth that anybody's going to want to do that anymore. I see everybody shaking their head and agreeing. Um, so we're Makes definitely, sense. it's been something that I've been there four years now and it was a, a battle to get a plated lunch menu for like the road shows, but they're definitely rethinking all of the menu um, service styles and presentations and how we're going to be serving that just because moving forward even if people dine out they're certainly not going to want to share um something else i heard that was really interesting and I, I can't remember if it was um my colleague rebecca gillickson from vegas or um i can't remember where i heard it but a lot of people are looking at retraining all of their staff's body language because everything now you can't really see it. You don't know if you're smiling, laughing, happy, sad, like swearing at the person at the table, except for your eyes. So all their body language is really going to be 
communicating to the guests at the table. So a lot of restaurants I've been reading are retraining their staff's body language for service. That's so wow. Yeah. yeah. About it. Like when you me. lie, you might lean in a little bit more. You're not as relaxed. Like everything you do with your body is transferring that energy in your words and your thoughts. And in hospitality, that's sometimes part of the best thing you do at a dining or at a dining establishment is everything they move and the way they present the dish and the way they make the flame come out and whatever it may be, we may not be doing that for a while. So I'm curious, I forget, but Holly, is your staff wearing masks? I'm sorry, the dogs were barking. What did you say? <laughs> is your staff wearing masks? Yes. Oh, yes. They masks, are. Gloves. Okay. Yeah. One of the cool things that my GM at Deacons, which is our steakhouse, decided to do is she got dry erase marker and that six foot line that we want to like keep the staff at we put um different movie quotes and she just sprays it with aquanet so at the end of the night you just mop it off and it comes right off it's kind of fun because it gives the guests something to read and it kind of gives a different type of experience because of that where we can't smile but it's funny you made that comment because i would love to see any body language like protocols yeah. that y'all put out because I notice myself, I smile. I smile at everybody. I'm really friendly. And when I'm walking up and down the street, I have my mask on and like, I'm just staring at people because they don't see me smiling. So I started like doing the like chin up, like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Anybody drawing a smiley face on their mask? <laughs> yeah. like, oh, I, was, I like, heard I've seen that with their lips. That person walking around Nashville yeah. just staring at people. <laughs> I so one of our um, sales managers was saying they have the Cheshire cat on their mask. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I find any of those articles about the body language, I'll definitely share yeah, it with Molly and Leita. I'm sure you could disperse it out to everyone yeah, yeah. and find it again. Um, one of the things we started doing, because um, at Beacons, we also have a charcuterie plate, which, you know, it's shared with the guests at their own table. So if they decide to order it, it's fine. But it's very extensive. It has three meats, three cheeses, a bunch of sides. So you have to explain it. So we got our um, staff laser pointers so they could point at what everything is versus where they used to like kind of glaze their hand over it. That's awesome. I yeah, also, that's great. on the mask situation, I was reading another article today about somebody design, I think it was a younger um, teenager designing a mask that had a clear space to it so you could actually read somebody's mouth and or see a smile or you know, for people who, who might not be able to hear, you want to still be able to read lips, let's say. Um, yeah. So I wonder if that might play into it as well in the type of mask that restaurants have. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we've those, been, I, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Just, um, so my husband's in the industry as well, and we've been seeing a lot of brand opportunities for masks. Like, it's all about the mask. You can sell them. You can put your, your logos on them, different things on. I'm sorry, my kids are in the background here. Um, so anyway, I think that it's going to be really, really innovative and cool to see what people do. And I did see the same thing about clear measures just to give that face and, and stuff. With Zuma, since we are Japanese, we do have some, you know, cultural respects that we can start really implementing, like bowing and just being gracious in different ways, but that of course doesn't apply to other restaurants. But um, mm -hmm. I think that I saw that I used to work for um, Thomas Keller Restaurant Group. So it was mm -hmm. something with them. So I'll search too and I'll share it uh, back in with you, Marissa and Loop and everybody. But I think it's, it's definitely going to be something that we all learn a new level of silent service and silent hospitality, um, which is going to be interesting. And exciting. Kind of exciting. I mean, it's a new thing, a new, gen a new uh, venture. Silent disco is going to have its heyday. It was like a yes. thing for a hot <laughs> second. And it's going to come back in a major way. Everyone's going to be like at a club and raving their own. Like, don't touch me. I'm just listening to my music. Six feet um, disco. Yeah. We have, um, oh, we, oh, we, so question in chat is for the states that have started opening up, can you give any insight into the sports entertainment aspect of your states? Are larger event venues starting to host concerts and other events at half capacity or no concerts or large events yet? Any insight would be great for some of us who work at the larger venue arenas. And Holly chimed in. Um, go ahead, Holly, do you want to answer that? I mean, yeah, I just, you know, for Tennessee, since it seems like I'm one of the only ones that the state is starting to open. Okay. Um, yeah. We are phase four is when it's over a hundred guests, um, which technically every 14 days, if our numbers are 
going down, then we would move to a new phase. But we're at a 15 or 16 now for Tennessee, um, and we're not at phase two yet. So I was told by somebody pretty much every 14 to 28 days, so maybe a month per phase is what you should like worst case scenario expect. Um, but phase four is when it could have 100 or more. So that could be August, September at the earliest. Um, I also have a friend that works for Live Nation that told me, a group of us, to expect to go to another concert in 2020. But so really sad. I, I, that makes me sad too, but it, I think that that gives the opportunity for that venue to sell their space for corporate and private, right? Yep. In a different yeah. way. And um, we were talking about that the other day about like baseball stadiums, you know, perfect example. Um, corporate retreats, anything, people, they have this unique opportunity where there's, they're not competing against those concerts and those baseball games and those football games, potentially. Hopefully football's back, right? Yeah, um, I think, Holly, have you seen, someone mentioned this to me the other day, that the CMA awards are still on. They are, and yeah. I mean, the Titans released their football yeah. schedule last week which October 4th uh, Steelers are going to be in Tennessee. So if anybody has any <laughs> friends, wants to hook, I'll be one month without, you know, being pregnant. So send them to kids. <laughs> I already told my boyfriend, we need a babysitter October 4th. We're going to the game. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there's certain things that are still going on, but I also keep up with sports. And NFL said the other day that wherever um, – the Super Bowl is supposed to be this year. They've already determined that they can have it a month later and the space is still available. So oh, wow. I think they're preparing worst case scenario because they can't even start training together yet. That was pushed off as of yesterday. So I don't know, you know, if they're not getting time to train, how that's going to work. I saw that too, Holly. A friend of mine works um, within the sports realm, not directly for NFL, but he does podcasts and, and does a lot of those. Uh, fantasy football leagues and they were talking about I think it's Giants Stadium is going to have all oh no excuse me Fox Sports News is going to pipe in the background noise of fans as though yep. they were live in the stadium mm -hmm. so they probably won't have any and then they have like masks under their helmet yeah, it really real like, if that happens and their mouth yeah. guards sticking out so they'll have bulges it's going to be real yeah. sexy have you guys heard about what's going on in Las Vegas with the sports realm no, no. So not, not only do we have this amazing new arena that was just built. I don't see if you guys have seen our Allegiant Stadium. That's like massive. It's our first year ever having a football team. So the Raiders are. It's their first year in Vegas. Um, it's huge. Mm -hmm. But they sold. I mean, some good news is they've sold out of tickets um, when they released them, and we're I guess now the top city for like they're so expensive just following in with the Knights when we just got hockey a couple years ago. So some good news there is that they're being purchased. People are ready to go. Um, but on the other side, there's some talks with baseball. I think it's between Arizona and Las Vegas, as well as um, basketball. Finishing out their seasons or doing their seasons in hotels. So like the hotel houses the athletes. There's all this because we can, because we have these empty venues and we have no people <laughs> and no conventions. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of talks about whole teams whole coming here and living here and finishing so that they can have their seasons, which is it's pretty incredible. And I think that that has a lot to do with why there's MGMs and the major uh, monopolies in the cities like MGM and Caesars aren't releasing what's going to open because they're still in works with their contracts with the NFL and um, other sports teams to oh. do this to make this happen wow would be would be interesting would be really interesting wow. again no crowds but we maybe zoom yeah. to cater them i don't yes. know <laughs> yes rebecca yes <laughs> um so uh, another thing that's come up uh is obviously people are more comfortable with being outdoors and luckily we're coming upon the nice weather where people can be outside. Are any of you starting to reclaim? I, I think, I, I forget what it was, the New York City Hospitality Alliance did release something about they're pushing off the fees for um, the sidewalk, um, what's it called, Marissa, when you get a sidewalk permit? Uh, I forget it's what it's a called. But it's a permit. Yeah. 
It's like a line um, of license and permitting for food and beverage uh, services or sales on like city sidewalks that are partially like, yeah. you know, if it's two slabs of con concrete, you get the first slab and the second one's for pedestrians. But I think they're pausing all payments and proposing right. to waive all those fees so that people can open. Um, I feel like it's in Maine also. The city is of of Gunquit, Maine is shutting down some roads so that restaurants can open earlier with outdoor dining that may not have otherwise. I have a friend up there that owns a restaurant and was posting about it. So I was really intrigued by that. I wonder if New York will follow in suit with that like 40 miles of roads yeah. closing for pedestrians. Exactly. I think, I think there's a movement nationwide for, um, the you know, I guess state by state or, or county by county scale to do some of this. If you're, if you guys are hearing about it, if your properties are considering it or taking advantage of any sidewalk or um, petitioning to have more of that road space, that might give you an opportunity to recoup some of that because people are going to be more comfortable being outside. Um, is there any, anyone that is uh, aware of that or knows anecdotally of other people around that are doing that? So they're, they're talking about doing it in Boston. Um, I only know that because I live in New Hampshire and on Monday they're closing down all major streets in downtown areas in New Hampshire. And, um, and they're, um, they're closing down all the major like main streets and they're allowing restaurants to have uh, larger outdoor spaces and for people to walk at a safe distance from each other because um, they're only going to allow outdoor dining starting on Monday. Um, but I also, I have a friend um, who owns several restaurants in Boston and he said that, like he's on a board with the city and he said that they're talking about doing the same thing in Boston. So like Newbury Street um, and some streets in Cambridge, Somerville um, and other places in Massachusetts. So hopefully it catches on, I mean, and, and spreads to New York. I mean, <laughs> I'd be thrilled, right? If yeah. like pedestrian, those pedestrian streets are, um, they're great. I don't know what it does for the rest of, traffic but you know it'd be nice to have that outdoor dining today um, was the, the first day they've done it in my neighborhood in brooklyn where they closed the streets and where they did it there's not restaurants there but there were definitely people taking advantage of the you know the additional space and walking around did they put up any cat like cafe seating or anything um the place that i walked down is just residential only uh so i was telling okay. the, the supermarket that was down there but um you know they the barriers were all out there and crossing mm -hmm. out the traffic. So people were definitely walking in the street and social distancing. Yeah, in Atlanta, and we're kind of like, have been on par with Tennessee. And I would say like Georgia opened, was one of the first states to open. And um, just from like watching the news, I've seen that people are definitely dining in at restaurants, but I myself haven't actually like done anything more than takeout still. Um, but as I'm like walking around our neighborhood and like going to pick up, you know, stuff like that's nearby, I am seeing more and more places that look like they have diners on their patios or like sidewalks. It's not so much of a problem here with like the traffic. Um, right. like I feel like a lot of places, especially in the South have patio space because when it's nicer out, like they can just expand, um, the amount of people that can serve that way. But it seems like that's the go-to. Like, I really don't know that many people who have um, dined in too, too much yet. But, like, patios seem fine because we would go to, like, a park and eat out or, you know what I mean? Like, you'd eat on, you'd eat on your own patio. So, like, especially if the service is safe. And, and I kind of was thinking about this earlier when we were talking about... Um, like wearing met the servers wearing masks and all that but you know i think feel like if restaurants can like show that they're safely serving people on their social media and like keep the the frame work positive there like we're, we're having people coming in they're enjoying it like our staff is safe our our guests are safe then like slowly more and more people are going to feel comfortable with that and i feel like it'll pick up um in the places that are at least reopen right now I am seeing a lot of social media where restaurants are getting their patios ready. You know, they might not know when they're opening, but they're definitely getting the hype up that, you know, yeah. this gorgeous outside space. Can't you 
you know, you just can't wait to be over there. And like being able to see visually, like how the tables are spread out, at least makes like me feel more confident about it. Um, there's like a, one of our favorite Mexican restaurants that's down the street that, you know, obviously has like a fourth of their, um, patio space actually set up because of the distancing, but it's like pretty spread out and, um, you know, it, it seems safe. So I feel like that like instills confidence that they're doing everything they need to and like they're ready to welcome people in. So, so just to that point up in the Catskills, it's Jana. I'm with, was with major food group, but our family has a restaurant that they opened at the end of last summer in the Catskills. Um, it's a Brooklyn transplant called the smoke joint. Um, mm that was in Fort Greene. So they opened it up in Livingston Manor and they're opening up this weekend. And what they did is they set it up mm. to be, it's, you know, a, a takeout restaurant that had um, benches that they have measured out to be eight feet apart. Mm. Um, so people can sit by, it's by the Willow Weemack. So they can sit by the river, they distance the benches. And so this will be the first weekend um, it's Sullivan County, which is still not an open county for dining, um, according to the governor, but they will see how it goes from a takeout perspective. And I can wow. let you guys know next week how it goes. Um, but just from a safety perspective, the consensus is, is that when, you know, people do start to venture up there, the hope is, is that they don't bring the virus with them because right now it's dormant there. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Really? But we'll see what happens over the next week. And I can, you know, let you guys know next week um, how it's going. That's great. Um, our luck, guests Anna. wearing, I know. Um, our guests wear, all wearing masks. In, is, is that a question, Helen, for everyone um, that's open? They are only going to let people order if they have a mask. You know, nothing, they don't enter into, they, they've set up a window, a counter window mm -hmm. per se. Um, and everyone who even comes up to the window has to wear a mask. And then they're going to set up with each table with its own hand sanitizer, you know, its own wipes to wipe down the table. And you, you know, if you're going to dine there, you're responsible for wiping down your own table. So right. it'll be interesting how many people take it to go and how many people sit um, and dine. But it'll That's great. Yeah, we'd love to hear. Thing. Yeah. Something, also follow them on Instagram. And, and they'll have pictures of, you know, how's it, how it is going. What's the name of the restaurant again? Smoke Joint Cat Skills. I can, I'll send the handle through the chat. Perfect. Awesome. That's exciting. One thing that Las Vegas saw that was pretty interesting for our huge weekend of being open at 50% capacity is a lot of traveling people, which um, a lot of people did not expect, but Southern California is only four hours away. And so there was a lot of, a lot of people traveling just, just to eat dinner because like, they can't stay in hotels here. So maybe they have a second house or they have friends they're staying with, but um, there was a lot of backlash. There's a lot of people did not want to, they didn't care about the guidelines. They're like, there was a lot of stuff that was learned over the weekend about um, how, how do you police people? How do you do this? And since Las Vegas hasn't been a hotspot of, uh, of COVID, it's definitely interesting to see the differences from people who are coming from maybe traveling from areas were a little hotter or they're under stricter re regulations than we are. Um, they have masks where the locals don't. It's very, in and we, where it's not mandated that we have to other than Costco. So it's really, really interesting. And I think from the guest perspective, it's, it's gonna be very interesting. Has anybody that's open, are you guys taking that on yourselves as the venue to police your guests? Do you remind your guests? How do you do that in a hospitable way that protects yourself. I mean, one restaurant here in Las Vegas, they were, there was almost a fight because they didn't, they wanted to be sat. They didn't care. Like, we don't care. We, we want your food. We want the, you know, it's, it's health or economy. It's kind of showing a divisiveness. Yeah. Um, yeah. The restaurants in Brooklyn that we have, guests are not allowed in unless they have a mask. 
So who polices that? The venue? Or do they know that? The, it, there's a sign. The, the okay. restaurants in Brooklyn are called Peaches mm -hmm. and Peaches Hot House um, and Peaches Shrimp and Crab. And it's the manager's responsibility. Um, and they've told people that they cannot come in unless they wear a mask. It's to protect your, not only to protect your guests, but you're protecting your employees. Right, right. In Tennessee, the staff is required to wear masks and gloves, but the um, yes or not. It is, it is recommended, but it's not required. So we have a big sign on the front door that says, do you have any of these symptoms? If so, please don't come in. And it's their prerogative if they have a mask or not in the store. And then I think we had talked about this before, but like for those who, nobody's really done the dining besides Holly at this point, but are they setting the mask down? How are they handling the situation with the mask while once they, if they do wear it in, you're sitting down, then are you removing it and setting it down? Are they just like bringing it down to their chin? Which is probably what I'd do is I'd probably just pull it down. Both, note to self, don't put it on your chin, don't put it on your head, it's now contaminated. So when you take it off, it you should take it off one ear, then take it off the other ear and then fold it. Fold it, you told us that. Yep, you put it up on your head, yeah. you put it down on your chin, you're now contaminated. I know I would get food on mine if I... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Same. Um, yeah, it's, it's been interesting. I, you know, being at risk, I've been wearing my mask everywhere. I, please don't tell my boyfriend, I went into Opry Mills today because I had to return sneakers. Won't say anything, Whitney. Um, <laughs> but I wore my mask the whole time. I sanitized before, I sanitized after I got in, I got out. I was done. I'm not allowed to go to for everyone who doesn't know, is like the biggest mall in Nashville that you could possibly oh my God. choose. It's the only to one to. Is that I needed to return shoes. <laughs> all the oh um, the stores in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, they all have signs on them that say, "If you don't have a mask, you can't get in." I mean, whether it's a little bodega, a laundromat, grocery store, like whatever, they they all have signs that say people need to. Yeah. Wear I think it's just based on the states, and that's the other odd thing yeah. to me. Um, right. right. You know, I, I personally wish everybody was wearing masks, but it's such, you know, like I mentioned earlier, that restaurant over the weekend that people were not social distancing, there was not one mask in that picture. So, you know, um, yeah. I had a question for everybody because I know most of you aren't open yet. And I heard that in Connecticut, when they go to phase one, they are only going to allow restaurants that have a patio to open first. Mm. And my question is, us having different types of restaurants, how do you feel about that? Like, to me, I feel like that's kind of picking favorites in a way. Like, not everybody has a it's patio. Like, not everybody has an opportunity. Yeah, it sounds classist a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Agree. I throw that out to the group as well. It doesn't sound it doesn't sound equitable at all. I mean, not that life is, but you know, it's it's in this yeah. scenario with um, it really gives an advantage to those spaces. And that's a science question, I think, as well, right? Like we're relying on different um, government agencies to give us sound evidence that it, you know, if you're inside, you're less likely or that there's these dramatic reasons for it. Um, I think that they, they did, they've shown some, um, they've shown some things about different air conditioning units, HEPA filters. I know um, the Venetians got crazy new filtration systems and things like that because we're missing our prime time for our patio seasons. Um, my husband's restaurant has a huge patio and it's gonna be too hot. So that's the other thing. Who wants to dine with 110 out? So there's a there's a lot going on there but I do think it is um unfair to 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 jump the gun and put that kind of a a, a staple on it in, in I mean but again I'm not in Connecticut I don't know um I've been there but it's gorgeous but I don't think that <laughs> for other restaurants it's not fair it's it's you know because there's no scientific evidence proving 100 percent right and there's this is all just you know yeah guidance at this point yeah. Yeah, we also, um, we've come up, we've been obviously consuming any articles we can that touch on this subject with restaurants and opening and safety. 
And we, I forget, Azure Kate might remember, Lisa, um, one of the articles um, was talking about the cost of opening. It might be, it might be cost averse to even open because of putting in those new HVAC systems, um, implementing all these extra safety measures. At what point, where's that, you know, that measure of revenue that's going to offset that cost? You know, I feel like we know this, right? That so many of these restaurants were, were operating in such slim margins that at what point can you recoup any of those costs? Um, and it's, I forget which article it is, but one of you, uh, somebody who knows maybe shared in the chat, but it was like the, the, the cost might exceed, you know, the results. So it's just, it's, it's such a sad time. And I don't want to, you know, bring us to that side of it. I want to stay on the positive of reopening and all of us trying to find um, more motivating, you know, safe ways to reopen without it costing an arm and a leg, but, um, and more sharing best practice on how to do that. Um, so if anyone else has any other, um, any other, I know we've touched in last week, there was a lot of questions about contracts and reshaping contracts. Um, has anybody else started to think about how you're dealing with events specific about um, those force majeure clauses, those um, deposits, how are you handling those? Is there still leads coming in on really on the event side? We haven't gotten too deep on the event side today. So anybody lead inquiries um, aside from weddings uh, and social planners, anything else, any corporate events coming in? Hey guys, um, um, my name's Alex. I am from Live Nation in Michigan. Um, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> Welcome. I wanted to just introduce myself because I haven't been on any of the other calls, but um, one of my friends forwarded this to me and I thought it was really awesome. So um, thank you. And I hope to be on the rest of the calls as well. Um, Yay. But as far as our contracts go, um, we are allowing people to postpone if it's within the stay at home order, which we're still under in Michigan. Um, so until the end of May is basically like um, under force majeure and then just to basically like be um, like good partners with our clients um, we're allowing some up until like July and August to postpone because we don't really foresee like being able to have like a huge wedding at that point still um, so far we've had people still inquiring about 2021 events so we're kind of just going and booking them as we can and then people in the fall that are already booked are also asking about moving potentially to 2021. Um, we haven't really opened that up as an option quite yet, but I anticipate in the next couple of months, we will probably have to, um, especially because like Holly said, you have to be in like the phases and we're not even open yet. So if they say like you can have a group of 100 and we have a wedding for 400, obviously it's not going to happen. So um, we're kind of playing it by ear, but Honestly, we're just trying to get on every single call that we can with people across the U.S. to try and like figure out what other people are doing who are already opening. So anyone else that has anything would be great too. I have a question for you, Alex. Alex, sorry. <laughs> um, what is your company doing in this pivot time for events? And I would assume concerts, like everyone said, are canceled. I mean, if you were to do an at-home concert, it's like the ones we've been watching on TV. Are you doing anything for your clients internally that are more like Zoom, remote, virtual? Um, so right now we're not because we can't even get into the venue to do anything. Um, what we're focusing on is what we're going to do when we're allowed, at least like just, you know, some staff um, allowed into the venue. And then trying to figure out how to execute like some virtual events um, where maybe just like a handful of people come in and produce it and then they can go ahead and stream it to their employees or something. Um, but without really having the parameters from the gov government, like we don't really know exactly yet. Hey guys, I'm gonna jump in here too. I work with Alex, I'm Bruce at Live Nation in Detroit. Alex, thank you for inviting me and those that are on the call here, pretty cool. Um, so something that we talked about as well, too, and I'd be curious to see, you know, what are you guys pushing down to your teams in regards to 
you know, best practices in regards to what you're telling your staff in regards to face masks and social distancing and washing hands. If you guys have any guidelines you can share with us, that's great. We have third party vendors that we work with. We're not a uh, restaurant company by all means, but we do have um, a couple preferred vendors that have sent some really good decks over that have been, you know, 30 pages long and would love to see those. So that would be helpful. Um, and second fold, um, I would say we kind of discussed here locally and to say, hey, you know what, you're in New York, you're in Tennessee. How do we do a regional event? And you have XYZ company that wants to do your party at, you know, in New York and you have branches in Chicago and Cleveland and Tennessee and Orlando. How do we partner together to be able to spread those, you know, 400 people out between four different venues so we all can be working? So food for thought. <laughs> Marissa looks like she <laughs> Hi, Bruce. Yeah. Marissa with Zuma. We have four restaurants in the U.S. Um, we've talked about timing things just because I'm working with our U.K. team to kind of coordinate a virtual cooking class for the U.K. hosted by our chef here in New York. So we're definitely exploring different ways to record these virtual meetings and then they can share it with their internal and have one go live and one not be live. Or you can book at different time slots if it's a live virtual webinar or a virtual cooking class in that in that regard. Um, and then your question earlier about um, healthcare practices, we don't have a 30 page deck. I think it's gonna be more like a ho hotel that would have that. For our restaurants, um, there was a memo sent out that anybody in, the, in Boston or Massachusetts, New York, Massachusetts and New York, we are required to wear face masks in public. So we were able to send a memo to all of our employees, those that are not following um, and adhering to the WHO and CDC guidelines with PPE will be sent home immediately without pay and um, what's that word? Like frozen for seven days. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah, because we're taking it very seriously um, and we're, we're implementing that regardless in our, in um, I believe Miami as well, where it's not required but we are trying to do our best practices, like Jana said, keeping your employees safe and then also keeping your guests safe. You only need one person to post a picture of you with your bare hands or your bare face. And I'll tell, I mean, I would never go back. I wouldn't even go to work if it was my workplace. <laughs> so I think it's that sensitivity that everybody has to have to practice well in the meantime. But I, I would think a hotel would have many more of those like national yeah. corporate guidelines laid out. Yeah. They do. The Venetian has publicized, has put theirs out. I don't know if you've seen it, Bruce, out um, on media anywhere, but the hotels have, it's like an 800 step plan and how they're, what they're doing. My, my husband's been on like a three hour call in the background uh, regarding the same and the different things that are, have to be done. They're also doing testing, mandatory testing. Everybody has to be tested. And I think because um, the fan, like, because of, He's been in the building throughout this in the Venetian. I have to be tested as well. His company is going to test me and my kids for our antibodies and COVID. So it's kind of interesting. They're taking a lot of um, strides here, of course, in Las Vegas, because um, we, we don't have a city to support our industry on um, at all. Like I think similar to Nashville and a lot of other places that are very um, tourist driven -centric, primarily. Yeah. Uh, is, that, is that the right word, centric? I don't know. So. Um, I can put that up in the chat or share some of that too uh, for planning, but yeah, definitely the staff. Um, what, I've, what I've seen in both documents is the staff safety is the number one priority, of course. The guest is uh, very important as well and um, temperatures and talking about different teams. They'll have team service where a group of, so in, in case one gets infected, all of those people will be um, sent to quarantine and then the mm -hmm. restaurant can still operate with the second team. So my GM can't, he's even on managers looking at how do they not work with each other on the same shift. It's very interesting. There's a lot of strategy and they're bringing in a lot of support to, to do it that way, to, to ensure the, the safety of the staff and the guests, of course. Yeah, I've, um, I've seen that too, actually. They've paired up staff with, uh, other staff members so that it's easier if one person gets infected, they'll know exactly who needs to also quarantine and not come back in. I feel like 
um, a lot of us have seen the same things, masks, gloves. Um, something I saw today that I didn't even think about was, um, and it was actually Whitney from at shoes, another customer of ours, but nothing preset on the tables, which I didn't think about, which is so simple, but like, you can't really have anything preset on the tables because just something in the air could come down. So nothing preset on the tables. Um, no, we don't have the mask law, like Holly was saying, and I have not seen any businesses take it upon themselves to say that people can't come in if they're not wearing a mask. Um, in other states that I have that are open, they, that do have mask laws, people are required to wear the masks while they're seated at the, um, when they're in the dining area. So when they get up to go to the bathroom, things like that, when they're seated at the table, they don't have to wear the mask because you assume they're eating. So um, that's what I've kind of seen there. And then I've seen some people even going as far as buying plexiglass. Some of my bigger restaurants yeah. that can seat up to like 700 people, Clyde's group in DC, they basically bought like a plexiglass warehouse because otherwise they're not going to be able to seat people safely. Yeah, because they're booths. They've got a lot of booths. Um, well, thank you. We're at our hour. Thank you everyone for joining us. We have, because we came up with some, uh, we had some tech issues with our surveys. If you would kindly, we have a link in chat, but we can send it out to you as well. We'd love to hear um, where you are in your opening process um, with your venues. Um, but I hope you can join us next week. Again, it'll be Wednesday at 3.30 next week. We'll send out the invite. And on Thursday, we have that special chat with Danny Meyer. So I hope you can join that too. But otherwise, be, thank you so much. Will you be emailing that later? Just because I know these, yeah. these social hours we go on Facebook to get to. So I want to make sure I don't. Yeah, we can email anyone who has registered in the past. We can email you out the link. So that's no problem. And we'll promote it several times on, on Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and Instagram, and put event, um, calendar events up for those two. Thank you. Thank you as always, everyone. We really appreciate it. It's from you that we're learning all this amazing information. So appreciate your participation. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.